Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm excited to be here today. I'm your host, Shana James. I'm here with David Levy, and we are going to talk about the new paradigm economy and healing regeneration through self-care, through mutual care, how to be generous without overgiving. There's a lot going on in the world today and a lot of stress, a lot of... Um, you know, tumult, you could call it. And so we're really looking at David's experience of how to go through, um, go through the fire in a way and rise again, like the Phoenix. And, you know, he's an amazing example of following life's trials and coming out on the other side, being even more generous. So thank you so much for being here today, David. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So let me just give you a quick bio before we dive in. So David has been the steward of Mayakamas Ranch and is the founder of Generosity, which is a social venture accelerator, um, an ecosystem to reestablish in the aftermath. For those of you who don't know, Mayakamas Ranch burned in the fire a couple years ago. And so with all of David's experience in public interest fundraising, in uh, incubating finance companies, in learning the money game, social action and investment banking. David is now using the land of Maya Kamas and putting together, convening, um, you know, a platform for do-gooders, for leaders of companies and causes. And your story is, is really amazing. And I think we'll get more into it you know, as the fire happened and as you lost something that you were, you know, putting your heart and soul and money into and coming out of it, I think is such a powerful example for men and just people in the world of how to keep going and how to create something even more amazing out of uh, what you could call a tragedy. So again, thank you for being here and for, for sharing this with us. Happy to. So where do you actually feel inspired to start in all of this? Because you've got incredible wisdom and that's, that's where I feel drawn is to ask, where do you want to start? Well, the, the fire is a starting point for me because it was the end of a lot of effort and yeah. hope. Yeah. And it's been over two years since that day, the ranch became no longer. Yeah. And it was a traumatic event. I was there with a group of our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually an RSF social finance national board meeting. They were the last customers and a group was checking in business diva. And it was a really a, sort of a, a time where it was like before fire and after fire. And I've been uh -huh. sitting in this place of what's next and just appreciating not only being alive after leaving that fire that yeah. night. But more importantly, it's really forced me just to sit mm -hmm. with it. And there was a lot of willpower um, and energy and uh, force and ego to create my commas ranch and keep yep. it going. 
Yeah. And a fire is sort of a surrendering yes. and a way to start new. And that's a pretty remarkable thing to actually be sitting in the aftermath of the fire, thinking about how that land and how whatever way I could contribute with my, my experience and my network of people and the vision, um, how can that be brought forward in the context of a post-fire regeneration expression? Yeah. So how many years had you been at Mayakamas before the fire? Well, we, we acquired the land as stewards in 2006. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So a decade or so. Yeah, yeah. It was a group retreat center. It was multi-purpose in nature. We had nonprofit board meetings and summits on key issues of the day. We had a lot of yoga yep. uh, retreats and workshops. We had family reunions. We had corporate. Wedding? I was actually in a wedding at Mayakamas Ranch. You went to a wedding there? I was, yeah, I was in yeah. the wedding. Yeah, they were, the Sunset Meadow, it was. Yeah, it was beautiful. Epic there, it still is. I mean, the land, the energy of the land has not changed in any way, it's been enhanced and yeah. it's quite so beautiful. What, what was it like for you? I mean, after you saw, right, this, your, your retreat center burned down and realized, oh my God, th this is no more. I have to create a new life, a new business. I mean, what was that like in those first moments? Well, I think you get right into the practical and you don't actually understand the full trauma uh -huh. about like that because it's about survival, getting out. Are people safe? Um, what, what do we tell the employees? What do we tell our customers? Yeah. So you're right in the moment of responding, dealing with insurance. Um, you're not even thinking too far ahead at that point. Right. Okay. And then as time went on and you realized, okay, something, something new, right? The, the Phoenix from the fire. I mean, how long was it before you got the idea of creating um, what you're doing now with the land and bringing people together as this, this platform? Well, the, the property was actually called paradise with purpose, DBA, my ranch. And I, <laughs> I think the fire has actually given that little paradise a new purpose, which is really to be a demonstration of how do you respond to living in a fire ecology? How do you respond to our earth sort of tipping into a new, a new normal of, of fire yeah. and to be the first business uh, incinerated in the Tufts fire? I feel we have a, you know, an opportunity to demonstrate what to do on that land and how it relates to the larger issues in California. Yes. For instance, you know, the buildings that we live in, how do we rebuild in a fire adaptive way that acknowledges that fire may happen again in a way that the structure could either survive or that you build nimbly on the land and lightly um, in ways that don't have the same risk. So, we're wrestling with that. Also, the issue of energy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, PG&E is in the middle of a reorganization. And how are we going to deliver energy in our state and who controls that? And we have an opportunity to create a microgrid using solar and battery and share our energy with our neighbors, which I think is part of the new economy, is sharing energy. We have water in abundance there. How do we use that for fire? suppression as well as to share the water and to reuse it and to conserve it and to slow it down when it rains so we have more of it wow right so there's the there's, farming growing food so really how to be an off the grid living laboratory for human and ecological regeneration is the opportunity and how we do that with our partners versus me Alone. holding the land yep. thinking about a transition that never happened and then a fire sort of reset the whole the whole opportunity. Well, right. And as you talk about that, it really does seem like, you know, to do this alone is is near impossible these days, right? It demands a collaboration and uh, uh, being in line with the ecological times, as well as what you've talked about, you know, we've talked about before this recording around healing and self-care and mutual care. And so it feels like Right, there's so many layers to this. Yeah, there's a lot going on for me and for all of us. You know, we're dealing with our, you know, our life 
moments, these, these uh, calamities, these tragedies, these traumas, these supernatural events that are beyond our control, yeah. they sort of shock you into realizing that you don't have as much control over so much of your life. But there are things you have a lot of control over, which is your attitude and how to make positive contact, mm -hmm. even with a really hard situation and how to transcend it and transform it into something to new. In a sense, it is like a phoenix where the event actually puts you in a better place in some ways that you never would have achieved without the... Uh, right. Never would have wanted, moment. never would have dreamed of. And yet at the same time, likely it would have been really hard to get there without something so large. Yeah. I mean, also, it's like, what choice do I have except to hit my next shot? I, you know, for me, the, my metaphor and my self-care is how to stay in the flow, how to stay in the zone, yeah. how to make your default state to be in the field and respond to whatever comes into your experience um, to respond from a place of being in, you know, a, a calm, centered place. Mm. How and, do you do that? What, what have you learned about that? You know, I've always been into sports, racket sports, you know, ping pong and tennis and squash and coached and played and competed. And, you know, I realized that when you're in those moments of hitting a ball back with another person, you're making positive contact with them. You're at your, in a sense, your, your personal, physical and psychological limits. Mm -hmm. And, and that it in a way prepares you for life itself, dealing with difficult situations or people or difficulties that you create for yourself how do you make positive contact and not necessarily take the bait of being reactive but simply mm. you know receiving it and responding you know in the most you know appropriate way yeah i mean i'm trying to imagine right you know the hitting of the racket like the receiving or kind of more of an aikido in a way than a than a forceful reaction or getting ahead of yourself, right? Like actually as the ball comes in, the, the response in that moment. Right, there's a technique where you can imagine the response before you actually hit the ball. Mm. So you're anticipating the future contact in the present. I think that's a lot about what we all need to do with our life is how do we imagine our future contact with the world and what would that look and feel like yeah and when you imagine it then it yeah. sort of shows up for you and you can say yeah that's in my movie uh -huh. i want to make contact with it so for me the fire was not in the plan but the more i think about it what a better place to model healing yeah regeneration than a center of a caldera an ancient volcano that was a group retreat center that now is going to be something new yeah and relevant to what we need in our local community and hopefully something that can ripple out to be beneficial yes. into the world for the people that are on that land, they're going to be more effective. Do you find that it's changed where you're responding from? Like when I imagine where you would have responded from in the past versus where you're responding from. That's a great now. question. Well, I mean, before I was responding as an owner in yeah. a sense, I had LLCs, I owned businesses, all my wealth was in the ranch and it all got wiped out. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking of owning things, I began thinking, well, maybe what I'm doing is I'm a trustee or a steward uh -huh. for the things of my life. And instead of owning things, I'm actually holding a sort of a, a relationship with the land that I'm inviting others to be part of where no one really owns the land, but we're taking care of it. And we're holding a shared vision of how to activate it wow. in a way that's beneficial. So that's sort of a fun way to look at the world. Yeah, I mean, a very different way to look at the world, right? Like I'm a sole owner or a, even a group owner versus a steward or an activator, you know, collaborating and, and bringing out more of people through this land yeah. or through this project. Yeah. I mean, what's been exciting is the land truly is rebirthing and renewing. It's beautiful to see the redwoods sprouting out, mm. you know, with green trunks and wow. the, the base is growing with new trees, the madrone with 20 children that were activated. Their seeds were activated because of fire. Mm -hmm. So 
there's a, a real beauty there. And, you know, the question of how we live in right relationship yeah. to sacred land, which ultimately our entire earth is a, is a sacred experience, you know, everything on it, all the living beings and creatures. And how do we live in a relationship to each other as human beings so we can have a better relationship with the earth, which is, mm. I think the issue is that we're not very nice to ourselves and each other in ways that we actually naturally want to be, but mm. the conditions in our, in our system often make it hard to think beyond yourself and your family yeah. to get to that third ring of others. And so there's a lot of competition for people to survive, you know, psychologically, financially, emotionally, even within their own relationships or family and getting that, you know, in right relationship is key, I think, to being able to have, you know, a foundation to be outward thinking about others. And so the land in a way holds that place where people and families, companies and causes can actually, you know, get closer to each other, sync up and actually be a force to help the others. And that's what that land is about is really the self care, the mutual care, and the collective care that we can create in a place like that. I love that, that shift from, you know, only self-care to including self-care, but then the mutual care and the collective care. And, you know, especially where we are in the Bay Area, there is, there's a lot of struggle and stress with everything being so expensive and, um, you know, raising kids, families, whatever it may be. It's just like, it's hard sometimes for people to get, I know it's hard for me to get beyond the daily, you know, what needs to happen. And, I'm curious if you have a vision for how people can make a shift, you know, those who haven't gone through a fire or something traumatic, do you see a path for how we can actually step out of this, uh, this model where we're, you know, kind of in the bubble of self focus into wow. being more generous? Well, I mean, Ironically, you have to be self-focused to be generous. So mm -hmm. the most generous thing you can do for yourself is probably to consciously shut your eyes and just sit with your breath, connect to it, connect to the thoughts that come up, observe them, let them go, go back to your breath and maybe drop into the zone and transcend mm -hmm. your breath and your thoughts. And from that place, you know, not only renew yourself, you know, physically and psychologically, yeah. But to actually, you know, have the ability to let something new emerge uh -huh. that you might not be aware of and to actually interact with the world from a much calmer place that allows you to actually, um, you know, realize what you really want. And I think our stress actually has the opposite effect from not only being effective, but it repels people away from us. So I think the most important first step is that self-care. Mm -hmm. It could be walking in silence. It could be dancing. Whatever puts you into that mind-body union mm. um, is a really important thing, whatever that is for you. Um, and I think from that place, we realize that our happiness and our healing is directly connected to others, that yes. we can't heal by ourselves. Yeah. And that when we acknowledge that we you know, don't want to be alone with our suffering, and that we actually, in our own healing, can actually help other people with their suffering by sharing our vulnerability. It's a really powerful place to be. And, you know, you know, not to get too far ahead beyond that, yeah. but when I think about, you know, what's missing in our society is I think authentic connection, yeah. a place where people are not in the, in the facade of um, the appearance and not really sharing what's really going on. I think mm -hmm. that um, Facebook and online identity has actually taken away from, you know, what it means to be human, to actually be with each other and somatic experiences, to play, to be in nature, to be in a circle together. Yeah. Um, those things are, are being lost. So I'm, really, I'm love... quite concerned. I'm concerned about where yeah. society is going. I'm imagining it going, the trend and the data is sort of in, but we know there's medicine to reverse that. And that's what I'm interested in. Mm. Yeah. I was just thinking how, um, there's so many things I want to say based on what you just said. And I, I love the simplicity and the, the self-care piece, right? That 
once, once we allow ourselves to actually have some time to get quiet and to go deeper than our thoughts, that recognition that we are connected and that our well-being is very much tied, you know, with, with others. Um, they always think of it like the Hippocratic Oath in medicine, do no harm. Yeah. So in a sense, when we're not nice to ourselves, we're doing harm to ourselves. It affects how we interact and, you know, influence others. And so it's really primary. It has to start there. I mean, I've tried to avoid working on myself all the time by <laughs> giving advice to others, but it always comes back to, I'm not really that helpful unless, you know, I'm in a centered good place and it's easy to get knocked off every day. Oh yeah. Every it's, a hour. Daily, it's a daily practice moment to moment. Yeah. You know, and then the day ends and you go to sleep and you, you know, it, you start anew. And it's um, yeah, you start it over again. One of the things I love that you said before in our conversation, again, before this podcast was that you really focus on how much good you can do before you die and have fun doing it. And, you know, it's amazing to me that you, that your personality or your way of being in the world is simultaneously generous and, you know, and serious about these very important issues and that you also still have a mindset of fun and play and, you know, coming together in these ways. I mean, in many ways, I live in response to growing up in Washington, D.C. Mm. D.C. is a very important place. It's sort of the thought leadership capital of our country and really the world. But many people that are in that game are very successful, very intellectual, but not necessarily very happy. Uh And there is a mindset of the status quo and how do you protect what you have. And I never really loved that consciousness. And when I moved to San Francisco, it really opened up my eyes that you were defined not by what you did, but what you like to do. And that people had a balance here around their work and their play and often their purpose being integrated. Yeah. So, you know, I do think that, um, you know, this idea of generosity is an incredible framing for our lives, which is that it's an acknowledgement that we're all connected Mm -hmm. and that when you're actually being helpful to others, you're literally, on a physical, psychological, and spiritual level, you're actually literally giving to yourself yeah. in the field, in the quantum field of uni- unity consciousness. You're actually all, we're all part of one thing, even though we're separate individual beings, yeah. we are actually in one field. And so for me, generosity, when I do it mindfully out of inspiration, without any expectation of getting anything back, when I truly do that, I feel the best. Now, there's different degrees of generosity where Sometimes there's more of an exchange, but, you know, the highest form of generosity gives you a great endorphin high. Yeah. And um, and when you do it in the right way, it's it's wonderful. And obviously it can be done inappropriately or in a manipulative way. Yes. Um, So it's an interesting question. You you have family, right? You've had 70 employees and um, you you've had a lot on your plate. So what would you say to a man who says, Oh my God, you know, I'm kind of underwater with work, family, kids, partner, you know, I I don't know how to go beyond that. Do you have any support or advice for that? Yeah. I think when you're at your limits and you you're aware of it, you have to look towards what renews you. If it's, you know, going outside and hiking or, when you walk in the house, say the first 90 seconds, I'm going to create positive energy because that'll set the tone mm. for my family the rest of the evening. That's a really good technique. You could be sitting in your car before you walk in, either for 10 or 20 minutes of, of meditation and breathing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think being with your friends and sharing with people outside of your inner circle of, of family mm-hmm. is really important. Um, being in support groups in any form is really, really powerful. Um, and if you can do it, going on a retreat. You know, our tagline at Maya Kamas was because sometimes the best way forward is to retreat. So literally the deep Ooh. retreat actually can be a powerful reset. Yep. 
And also just asking permission not to talk. Sometimes you're not in a good place and people want to interact with you. Sometimes you can say, you know, I'm not in my best, best self right now. I'd really appreciate um, some time alone. Love the vulnerability and the strength of that, right? It's like a knowing that, okay, I need, I need something for myself here and I will be better and more generous and more connected or more able to relate to you if I do this for myself later. Um, will you go back to the, the setting, the tone when you walk in the house? Because that feels very empowering to be able to do that, right? Versus just to walk into any situation and kind of be at the, the whim of the situation. Mm-hmm. What's your way of shifting that? I mean, again, it's that idea of anticipating the future and the present. So it's like realizing you're walking to your house, you haven't seen your family all day. You may be carrying your work and annoyance of your commute. And just to acknowledge that and to say, all right, I'm not bringing that in the house. I'm leaving that outside the door. And you come in and, you know, come in and hug your family or acknowledge them directly and ask how their day was and make eye contact and listen and be present versus, you know, going into the house and going right to watch the news or to do something for yourself. So it's that making that positive contact when you're walking into your home, mm, I think that's an, it makes you feel good. And yeah. actually it does change the energy. And I think that when we realize how much we affect each other, yes, that we can use that influence and really, in more conscious ways. And when we mess up, acknowledge it. Yeah. You know. It's so powerful. And I, I'm seeing the balance too, right? Like as a man or even just as any human being able to set the tone and come in, like you said, in a loving way and be connected and listen and all of that. And especially for men, not having to, uh, just keep shoving down your upsets or frustrations, right? Like also finding a way where you can be vulnerable with people about that, whether it's your partner or your family, or like you said, support groups or someone else so that you're not just overriding all the things that happen to you in order to set that tone. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I mean, and believe me, I am not the standard of, you know, you know, perfect harmony and and energy. (laughs) Nor should anybody be. I am not, I am not the standard, but when I don't do it, which is most of the time, you know, it, it changes the 30, 60 minutes, you know, that first time. And so 90 seconds actually can actually changes the energy. It's so powerful. Yeah. Okay. This is awesome. And I can feel, um, you know, the, the wisdom you're bringing around the unexpected and how to step into something, even when it wasn't what you thought it was going to be and how to, you know, be more of a creator than reacting. And just curious what, before we wrap up, what else do you want men to know? What feels important? Hmm. What else do I want men to know? I mean, it's really important that all of us, you know, have the courage to look at our life situation with honesty. Yeah. And we have so many, you know, defenses and, you know, armor around us to survive as men in ways that, you know, women do as well, but for men, it's a unique kind of armor. And I think returning to play is really important because I think men often in our society are taught that when you're young, you play and when you get older, you have a career and you work and you take care of your family and you put aside, you know, your own joy. Yeah. So my message is if you didn't play a lot as a kid, find a game and start playing. And if you did play, return to your game or find a new one, because not only one does it bring you incredible fun and something to do with your family and your friends, it's incredibly social Mm -hmm. and you learn all about yourself and it makes you more effective in everything you do. So my number one message is never stop playing. Mm. 
I feel so grateful that in the midst of, you know, you going through a tragedy that we would never wish on anyone that you're, you can see, right. The, the wisdom of play and the wisdom of interconnection and, and treating each other really well and bringing not only, um, not only the strength, but the vulnerability, you know, being in connection and the authentic connection that, that we're, we're moving away from these days, how necessary it actually is for our hearts and our souls and our businesses, you know, all of it. Yeah. I would just add that when we think of playing or sports, we think we're playing against someone, Uh but next time you go out there, look at that person as someone you're playing with who actually is part of you having a great experience. So the whole idea of being in flow and making positive contact, especially with a racket sport, yeah. even though you may keep score, you're really playing with the other person, yeah. not playing against them. And it changes your attitude about everyone in business, the person driving the car down the street, the person at the grocery store, mm. that we're all sort of playing together. And we're in this incredible, you know, I see it as a big game of joy with serious challenges and you know, suffering along the way, but we just need to figure out, you know, how to look at it as something that we learn and grow and continue to make positive contact with whatever comes into your game and whatever comes into your life. You have a choice on how you respond. And that really is what defines you. That, you know, it's the tragedies and the tough circumstances that your response to those actually defines what your life is going to be like. Mm, Thank you. That's a powerful note to end on. So thank you so much for being here. And how can people support your cause? Well, I mean, there's nothing I'm asking anyone to do right now. I have an inner circle of advisors that will be, you know, determining the future of generosity at Maya Kamas. We were looking at rebranding it as Maya Kamas Sanctuary. Mm-hmm. So if people want to stay updated on that, they can just simply go to mayacamasranch.com, M-A-Y-A-C-A-M-A-S ranch.com. And that gives a sneak preview to the future. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Well, may people be as generous with you and your collaborations and convenings as you are with others. I'm blessed to be around people who are extremely generous and it makes it a lot easier to, to do, to do that for others. So thank you for having me on the show and giving me the chance to share this um, conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of man alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144, or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.